since the restored, uh, it's been like re, I don't know what to get to it, whatever these young people with their electronics do now, that was shot on film, film, you guys remember that? <laughs> How old were you? I was 20. 20 years old. I was 20 years old, it was uh, the summer of 1973, thank you. Now, if you bring that one down a little bit, the amber one right, the Tiffany right here. Thank you. Um, great, thanks. Whoever's up there, powers that be, thank you. Um, so it was the summer of 1973, 41. We wrapped that uh, August 18th, so it was this week, 41 years ago. Nice. We, we wrapped the film. I was 20. I started out the summer doing a a children's play in the Goodman Theater in Chicago called The Terrible Tales. <laughs> uh, I was dressed in green and yellow tights and uh, dancing and singing and telling folk tales from around the world to children six, uh, six days a week, two times a day for $175 a week. Or like 11 bucks a show or some shit like that. And then I got called to do this. So the first part of the summer I was doing a children's play entertaining kids, and the second part of the summer I was hitting a chick over the head with a sledgehammer. It's disturbing. And I got paid for both gigs, so it was kind of a, it was, it was neat. It was only my first, my first year as a, as a, a paid, a professional actor. So, and, you know, 41 years later, here I am talking about it. I had no idea, no idea. What was the cost you got for the film? I beg your pardon? Uh, The original budget was $85,000, hmm. and it didn't go far. Uh, so we shut down for a couple weeks, and they had to come up with some more money. And they came up with another $50,000. So the uh, the final shooting budget was would be about $135,000. And then they had to get more money uh, for post production, it was about 200 grand probably by the time they got it all done. Yeah, if anyone has questions, just let me know and I'll bring the mic to you so he can hear you properly. So, anyone have questions, just raise your hand and I'll make my way to you, okay? Okay, here we go. Yeah, uh, shortly after the movie uh, was filmed, they had a, a movie here in Jackson called Demon Lover. Is it, anybody hear of that one? Never heard of it. Uh, Gunnar Hansen was supposedly in it. Was he in it? You know? I don't know, but you know, I vaguely remember him telling me about doing a film in Michigan. Yeah, because my father is in that movie. He pumped gas in a small part where, like, the, the devil worshiper, it was, they were almost like Spinal Tap type people pulled up in this car and then my dad is in the movie and he pumps gas for them at the gas station he worked for here in Jackson. And supposedly Gunnar Hansen was in the movie. I do, as a matter of fact, it's, it's funny you should say that because I recall him saying something about doing a, a film in, I was working on this film in Michigan. Okay. But I thought it was like about giant uh, grasshoppers or something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of us have done, well at least Gunnar and I have done uh, several things that we probably can't remember doing in the last 40 years. Um. All right, next question. Hey, John, question for you. On set, or offset, um, did the, the cast of the family remain separate from the cast of the kids? Did you guys mingle in between takes at all, or um. isolated?
first person I met the first day on set was Paul Partain, who I suspect, I, I don't know if you heard me laugh in the back, but he, every time I see this film, I find some other little nuance of Paul's performance. I just, I just think he's marvelous in this film. We lost him years ago, but God, the whole, <laughs> just, the, just the idea of them going off into the mess keep, <laughs> him in that wheelchair, the whole idea of it just cracks me up. And if you, <laughs> you know, if you knew Kim Hankel, <laughs> you'd understand. But God, he had such a sick sense of humor. Yeah, let's have her have to push him in the dark through all this mess key, you know, and, and <laughs> you know, Kim's original idea, and then, of course, Toby being such a sadist, he was like all over it, you know. <laughs> Poor Marilyn. I mean, she was actually pushing a 250-pound guy in a wheelchair through Mesquite at midnight. <laughs> so they were like really pissed at each other. And if you heard the line, it always cracks me up. He goes, "Bear down and push forward." Or he says something like that. He was really telling her the truth. He just, <laughs> just she couldn't get the thing to go. You know, and, and Toby would just let it roll on stuff like that. And the whole fight over the flashlight from the van. You know, I'll go with you. I'll go. I'll go. I'll, wait, 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 wait. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go. <laughs> if you knew Paul, you know, and he was the first guy that I met. He had a Paul Partain had done a couple of films, and he was one of the only. Uh, he and uh, Jim Cena and Nick Marilyn had done a bit part in the film or something. We're the only people who'd done any film. We were all theater actors and stuff. And then Gunnar, who was a writer, <laughs> you know, just doing a film for the summer. Um, and uh, I got to set the first shot my first day in town. I think I just got off the plane and hopped in a pickup truck and went out there. And uh, Paul was sitting there. He had a 1967 Cadillac with a white convertible, red leather, leather interior, the top down. And he had those huge fins. And he had the trunk open, and he had some like uh, lawn furniture set up, like everybody was going to sit around and talk to him. He's all alone in his wheelchair with his empty lawn chair. He had the trunk open and a big, huge cooler in the back of the trunk, with all filled with cans of beer and soda pop. And he just come on, right over there. Come on over here, partner. Sit down and join me, because nobody would talk to him. He was such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Because he, he was like a real method actor kind of dude. He never broke character. And he was just irritating. <laughs> and it really, and, uh, I really liked him a lot. I thought he was really cool and funny. But uh, the other uh, the actors that he had to act in the band with, and all, they spent a lot of time in a broiling hot van. Very tight. And it wasn't just them. They had a director, a camera guy, and a sound guy in there with, with them. <laughs> And uh, they couldn't open the windows because of road noise. And it was 100 degrees outside. So, <laughs> and he was just still whining. You know, <laughs> you know that, that shit that he did. <laughs> I don't know what the original question was, Roger. <laughs> Whenever I think of Paul, oh my God. <laughs> it just, and I can't, I, I have a hard time watching a film and saying it's a horror film. To me, a lot of it's a, a comedy to me. Because I know all those people, and I was there all the time, and I know the inside jokes, and you know, when somebody fell down, blew up a scene or whatever. I really drifted off subject there. Um, uh, what, what's your uh, stance on any of the sequels or the uh, reboots that have happened over the years? I have, honestly, there's been, I think, six or seven done. I was in, uh, of course, the first one. I was in the fourth one, which I'd never seen. With Matthew, <laughs> with Matthew McConaughey and uh, Renee Zellweger. <laughs> I had a, a scene with Renee when she was playing. Yeah, it was a bad one. For me. What? <laughs> uh, I've never seen the whole thing. I have seen, uh, I saw a rough uh, cut up because I had to do some ADR on it after the fact. They sent me like a cassette tape. But it still had time code on it. It wasn't edited. Uh, so I've really never seen the film. Uh, I don't think it had any sound on it yet. Or something. It was real odd. So I spent the day with the 
my two-year-old Renee Zella here, but she wasn't Renee with the Zella hat. I don't know who she was. Uh, she wasn't anybody. I mean, she was Renee, but she, anyway. So I was in the... <laughs> And it's got uh, my friend Lou Perry, my late, the late great Lou Perry, uh, who was in it. And uh, Jim T. Dowd, wonderful, and I, and I have since become friends with Bill Mosley you know, over the years. Um, and he's terrific in it. I like the second one. It's a totally different type of film than the first one, but I like it. It's a standalone film, really. Uh, and then I was in. Boy, but it started a lot of comfort. You know, a lot of people really didn't like it. You know, Mother's Face isn't all huggy, kissy, you know. All that stuff. But uh, they bought, that production company bought, bought the rights to do six films. They do the prequel, right? They just announced this last week. That, uh, the second in a series of six. So they had to change the story curve. They had to do something. They'd beat the shit out of the story. Had to change it somewhat, you know. So they introduced the whole family dynamic, you know. Do your thing, cuz you know, when she slides that chainsaw gun, you know. Uh, a lot of people didn't like that. I liked it. Are you involved? Well, <laughs> I, I took it somewhat. To what extent? I don't know. I th I sent off a uh, uh, last week. A, email to Carl Mascone, the producer of the exec, saying just a reminder. I'm always available for casting, <laughs> and believe it or not, he got back to me in about four hours. He says, oh yeah, I'm thinking of you. So, I'll be involved somehow. I know in what capacity, I don't know. But. Next question. What type of horror excites you? I beg your pardon? What type of horror excites you? What type or of horror, horror excites you? Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or. <laughs> uh, I, I'm an old classic, you know. Uh, you know, Morris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., and then as a, as a young teenager, probably uh, Vincent Price kind of horror guy. Honestly, I don't watch a lot. I, I do actually I do now because people give me stuff and I, and I have friends in the business and, and uh, I like horror comedy such as Roger and my friend Dean over here do these two Michigan independent horror filmmakers sitting right here. And as long as we're talking about that, uh, one of the reasons I'm in Jackson, Michigan is I'm doing a film with uh, it's called uh, Devil's Inc. with a whole bunch of people are here tonight. Uh, Who's that waving in the old back here? And I have a list, let me just, just so I don't forget anything. But uh, they were kind enough to bring me up to do the film this week, and then to set this up so we could raise some money for, for uh, last, last Day Dog Rescue, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful dog rescue thing. They foster out dogs, and make, you know, they get them fixed up and placed in homes. So, but, uh, I'm, I'm doing a film here called Devil's Inc. with uh, Glendale Oakwood Productions and and uh, Manchester in, in conjunction with Manchester Films. So I would like to thank Eric and I and Alex Pruitt uh, with Glendale Oakwood Productions uh, and Manchester Films, Brad Case, David Wilkes, and uh, Caitlin Wilkes, and the cast and crew that I've worked with this week: Michelle Lee Baker, Phil Nitro Monahan. Everybody knows him. Emily Webster, Madison Monaghan, Greg Langman, William C. Fox, Nathan Wakefield, and if I've forgotten anybody else, and Mike the Dick. Oh, that's Michael Lee Baker, isn't it? Yeah, I <laughs> So I, I am here working on a, a, a locally produced film. So. And I know how I got sidetracked into that. But I just wanted to say thank you to all you people. And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Last Day Dog Rescue has a table out there, and there's people with donations, so anything you can do to help, that would be terrific. Um, anybody have anything? Ask it something. Come on, that's a Q&A. 
Bring it up. Well, I have a couple here actually from uh, Facebook, which is one of, one of them is What is your favorite horror movie not named The Texas Chainsaw Massacre? My favorite horror movie not named The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'd say for old, you know, as a child, uh, I always, the first, first thing that pops in my mind is the original, the, the Wolfman with Lon Chaney. centipede kind of thing that would attach itself to your spine and you, that, you kind of turn into a wolf. <laughs> it, it was really gross. It was a yeah. thing. And it, but there's a scene in it where it gets loose in a movie theater. And you're like in a movie theater watching it. You know, so you're like, <laughs> it was real scary when you're like eight years old. And as modern horror, I'd have to say Hellraiser. <laughs> I think it's one of the scariest movies I've no shit. I think it's one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. And uh, yeah, so for modern, but that's not, yeah, that's not even modern now. But as an adult, probably the most frightening movie I've seen would be Hellraiser. That's weird because it, you know since I saw it, I've, I've met Clyde Barker and, and Doug Bradley and all those people because I, now I'm famous and all that stuff. <laughs> so I walk among great messes. I guess, does that answer that question? Yes. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in film? Where did I grow theater? up? Yeah. I grew up in West Central Indiana, a little town called Brazil, Indiana, which uh, is the largest city between Indianapolis and Terre Haute, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I got involved in the uh, I was always kind of an outgoing kid, I guess. From a real noisy, like Irish immigrant family, too. We were real, you know, real talkative, gregarious, big, kind of hard drinking family. Uh, wow. So I got involved in, in theater in, in high school. And one of the reasons was that the, that the, uh, uh, Voice and speech drama teacher, the speech and drama teacher, who also did the theater stuff, was doing this play, and it was like a period piece, and this was like 1969 or something. And she said, any, any, they always had a hard time getting guys to come out, boys to come try out. We didn't say audition, we said try out like it's for a baseball team or something. <laughs> No, it's audition. Try out for a play. Um, and she said anybody that got, any guy that got into this play wouldn't have to have their hair cut for at least six weeks. That's in 1969. And man, more guys showed up for that audition for that play than any in like the history of the theater club. Because getting your hair cut was a big deal in 69. Because they had the dress code. You know, your hair had to be an inch above your eyebrows and off your, your top of your ears and off your collar and all this goofy stuff. Anyway, I ended up getting the lead role in this play and I, I just fell in love with it. Fell in love with acting. And I, by the time I was a senior, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Beginning of my senior year in high school, I started really thinking about studying theater. And I ended up going to uh, the Goodman Theater at the Art Institute of Chicago. Years doing theater in Chicago, and, and uh, I don't know. I never had really anything that I was really good at, like doing, until I found theater. It was just one of those things. All right. Next question. Yeah, in relation to uh, the actual chainsaw massacre crimes and everything, uh, and the information that was known back then, how much of that crossed over into the movie? Would you tell us? How much of what? How much of the actual crimes that were committed in, and, and the, the fact actual that crimes that were committed? Texas Chainsaw Massacre is really, really very loosely based on the crimes of Ed Gein, who wasn't in Texas. He was in Wisconsin, 
and didn't really use a chainsaw, and only really killed one person they know of, I think. He was more of a, like a grave robber necrophiliac character, and there wasn't a whole family, it was just him. He had mother issues. I, there's a lot of stuff taken from that. The whole canning of human hides thing and all that, he did do that. But, as, you know, there was no chainsaw massacre. Ed Gein's been the basis of several films. Psycho, you know, the usual of Ed Gein and Psycho. What's the other? Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs? Before that, though, there was something else. Uh, Deranged. Deranged? Deranged is basically like a, a biopic about it. It's like the most realistic depiction of what really Yeah, but there were some more obscure things like Psycho. You know, just where the usual, the, you know, the whole mom issue was Psycho. You know, that was an edgy inspired thing. But, uh, yeah, interestingly enough, though, Silence of the Lambs, our uh, production manager, Ron Bozeman, won the Academy Award because he was producer on Silence of the Lambs. So the, our, our production manager for Texas Chainsaw Massacre was produced Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> we had many award winners come out of the franchise. I mean, yeah, Ron, Ron won for producing Silence of the Lambs, and then, you know, since then, you know, Matthews won awards, and Mays won awards. I won my best vestibule award my senior year in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but that was before I did, uh, I got a pedestrian pass, right? Because I was kind of a hippie, I showed it on the back of my dungarees. <laughs> they were like Navy issue that I got at an Army Navy store in Indianapolis, Indiana. I sewed my pedestrian pass on the ass. I was a hippie cool. I'm really ashamed the shit out of you people. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I've always wondered since I've seen the movie the first time and you were actually one half just now, whatever happened to the truck driver again? <laughs> he just keeps on running. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Have you met Ed? He's been on the road the last few years now. With us. I was with him in Germany last year and Indianapolis the year before last. And I will see him again in Austin, Texas in October where we're all, all of the Living cast members will be together in October in Austin. And of course, we just lost Marilyn, just like two, two or three weeks ago. Oh. That was really terribly sick. But uh, it's a really neat guy. <laughs> really old bohemian kind of dude. Does really, and he started acting again. He owned that truck. The Black Mariah was his truck. He was a, he was a truck driving musician. Temporary jazz musician or something, and he drove, but he drove like a cattle truck or something. Like that. And that was his uh, tractor trailer. You know, it was called it was called the Black Mariah. And, and uh, I bet he wishes he had that truck. Now. <laughs> At least the door. Yeah, the door. <laughs> yeah, the door. I think he's getting. As a matter of fact, I heard a rumor he was getting like fake, uh, like replica doors made up, that, like sign and sell. So. Uh, Um, do you have any desire to write or direct, or is there a dream project that you'd really like to be involved in? Do I have any desire to write or direct? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I don't want to direct at all, ever. Far too much work. Um, no, seriously. I, it's just to me, it just seems like an overwhelming amount of things to think about. It's just not, I, I couldn't do it. Oh, well, I'll tell the director. <laughs> but, but I don't want to do it myself. As far as writing, I, you know, that's another thing. I, I, I've always, I, I've always seen myself as more of a conceptualizer than a writer. I have great ideas, but I've never managed to put them down and put them in any sort of 
you got to see some of these guys work. It's what is it? What is it? We got uh, uh, the Dave Planner of the Dead, award winning poem by written and acted in by Dean Vander Bull Bootin Bootin. <laughs> and <laughs> little Dutch boy over here. The little Dutch, the little Dutchman over here. <laughs> and we've got Roger Schultz. We've got uh, uh, Meat Puppets. I, which I can't even explain, Meat Puppets. It, it, it happens. It. And the talented team of Eric and Alex from uh, 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 Eastland Kodak Productions or whatever the hell you guys are. <laughs> question for you. Um, what is your opinion of the whole reboot process? Do you think that it, it, do you like it because it brings more exposure to the franchise in general, or do you worry that with the, all these movies being rebooted, people will not come and like check out the originals? Oh, reboot as in just redo? The, yeah, I mean, a lot I've of people have issues point, with them. I, I've never seen the point of cover tunes either. I'm kind of real snobby about that shit. You know, I don't, why? I just never understood why. Unless it was like a, a good idea that was made terribly, then maybe I could see redoing it. But if it was really, if it, if I, I don't understand redoing a classic. I don't understand it. You know, I, it, I was the guy who was so pissed off when Bobby McFerrin had a huge hit with Moondance. Back in the, you may be too young to remember that. But back in the 80s, and everybody's thinking this is such a great song. I was like, Jesus Christ, I didn't forget that. Yeah, he, wasn't it Moon Dance? It was a Van Morrison tune. Oh, that's right. oh my God, and he just butchered it. Butchered it. People just love it. He had an enormous hit with it. And I'm sure Van was very glad because he wrote it, and he made a fucking fortune off of it. But <laughs> why? <laughs> why? I just don't get it. That's my answer. To that. So, not a fan then? Right. No, not at all. I, right. yeah, we'll look up, if you get a chance, look up uh, a Google John Dugan drunken zombie interview, and I get a really, really good answer to that question. But it's loaded with the family. What's your character in Devil's Inc.? What? I'm sorry? What's your character in Devil's Inc.? Devil's Inc., I play the mayor. I play the mayor of a middle to small size machine. No, I'm really like a real asshole, <laughs> I think. I started out when I first read it, I thought this guy's kind of an asshole, but after three days with these guys, uh, he's turned into a real asshole. <laughs> Today we made him a super asshole. I've had so much fun working with these guys. It's, uh, they are so talented, funny, easy, laid back, but concentrated and, and serious at the same time. It's hard to explain, but I, I've had a great time. When you read the script, and how long did it take you to accept that part? Without, I mean, you know, you had to read it. Chainsaw? You know what was going on, 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 you know, at the beginning. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you talking yes, about? Yes, yes. Uh, no, I, 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 I accepted it side of the scene. Oh, I didn't read the script until after I said I'd do it. You're brave. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you get from Chicago to an obscure film in Austin, uh, Texas? You want the long version of the Troopers. You can do the Reader's Digest and Kim Hankel was married to my sister. Yeah. And he called me. Oh. And said, I'm doing a film this summer. I got a part for you. Nice. I didn't know him all that well. I've met him just a few times because of the geographical distance. You know, distance. Um, I knew he was a writer. I knew he dabbled in some films. Uh, yeah, I met him at the wedding. And Why do you ask? So I got something I want you to do, and he just explained it to me 
Do you still get a chance to uh, perform on stage, or do you have any desire to go back to the theater? I, uh, wow. Well, you do a lot of that still, don't you? Uh, I, 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 I would be mortified, I'd be terrified. But uh, this is where I started. And given the right role, Horatio probably is the worst written character that Shakespeare ever wrote. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing there. You stand next to Hamlet and go, yes, my lord, no, my lord. Uh, not really sure about that, my lord. <laughs> uh, get you later on that, my lord. You know? <laughs> and then at the end you go, good night, sweet friends, and blah, blah, blah. I just, it, but it's not poorly. I've written part, obviously, but I couldn't get it. Really, the biggest failure of my aunt, that I've ever had as an actor was playing Horatio and Hamlet. It was just awful. Awful to the point where if I had a good night, if I had a good night, everybody in the cast would come up to me and say, You were great tonight. <laughs> wow, what happened? You were good tonight. It's like, You mean I suck every other night? Well, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I'd do it again, yeah. Why, oh, you got something in mind? <laughs> Another question for you. It's been talked a lot about the, the dinner scene, how incredibly hot it was, because it was a blocked off set in, uh -huh. in, the, in the heat. How bad was it in that much makeup? Oh, it was fucking butt off. It was terrible. It was terrible. And the makeup trailer was kind of air conditioned. But this is a, it was an old Winnebago, really old beat up Winnebago. It was, it was kind of like the, the original uh, meth lab that what's-his-name had in, uh, yeah, you know, 
guys I don't beat up. Walk away. That, that was like our makeup and costume trailer. And, and it had kind of a window area in it that kind of blew cool air. But uh, once you stepped outside of that, it's terrible. And that liquid latex. I sat down in the makeup chair until the time I got the makeup off. It was probably somewhere between 25 and 30 hours. And there's just no, and there, there comes a point, I don't know if you've ever been really in, in incredible amount of pain or, or just really uncomfortable, but you reach a point where it just can't get any worse, and then you have to use sort of the power of your mind or something just to kind of go away, just Otherwise, you'll go insane. That's how bad it was. <laughs> you know, it's reached this point where I'm just going to explode. And, and something takes over. This sort of zen thing happens. And you just, like, go away. Did you ever read the book Papillon? Mm -hmm. But what he would do, what Papi would do, he get thrown in, into solitary again. And the first thing he would do is pace off his cell. So he knew exactly how many steps to run. And then he started pacing. Pacing until the repetition would put him into a, like a meditative state. And he'd just be somewhere else. And that's how he survived. And that's kind of what I had to do for two days, was get into like a Zen mode. That, that photograph I have of me sitting outside in my chair, that's exactly what I was doing. Somebody took a picture of me. I love that photograph. But I was totally away. Thank you very much.